covariate adjustment. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about the recording. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, we have two discussants today, uh, Nan Laird from Harvard University and Eric Chaikin-Chaikin from University of Pennsylvania. Questions today will be handled by Dominic. So I'm uh, giving over to him. Yeah, as usual, please submit your questions via Q&A. Um, Maya has a few natural stopping points where she will stop and uh, we'll, uh, she'll take the questions from Q&A. All right, um, that's it from us. Thank you all for coming. Um, and with that, we're handing over to Maya. Great, well, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here um, and especially so with today's two discussants. So Nan Laird and Eric Chuck and Chuck, and of course, have both made really seminal contributions to the fields of selection bias and missing data. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna be talking today about work that is um, on a common cause principle for how to eliminate selection bias and causal S demands using covariate adjustment in ways that are similar to what we're familiar with doing for confounding. And this is work with Ilya Spitzer and Tyler Vanderweil. So I'm gonna be talking about bias that arises from selecting certain observations into analysis. And this could happen for a number of different reasons. It could be an inherent feature of the way we collect data. So for instance, if we do case control sampling, we are you know, choosing individuals based on their outcome. Um, alternatively, maybe we sample participants who have some pre-existing health condition that's related to the outcome. Alternatively, or in addition, selection can also happen during analysis. So one example I'll be returning to is when we have missing data and we handle it by doing a complete case analysis. That's a situation where selection into analysis is based on just whether you're a complete case. Could also happen if we condition on certain kinds of covariates and analysis, like for example, post-treatment variables, um, and then we could end up with some kind of collider bias. So the goal today is to be motivated by familiar graphical results for confounding that let us decide which covariates to control in order to eliminate the bias. So just as a brief reminder, one graphical way of thinking about confounding, and it's certainly not the only definition, but one definition would be that it's bias arising from a backdoor path between the exposure A and the outcome Y that is unblocked, conditional on whatever variables we've adjusted in analysis. and so. We're familiar with eliminating confounding, at least in principle, by controlling for appropriately chosen covariates. And if we've got a DAG in hand, we can use well-known graphical rules to decide uh, a set of variables that would be sufficient to eliminate the confounding. So in particular, one such rule out of, out of various possibilities is what's sometimes called the common cause principle. Um, and this was articulated in some of Perel's early work. And so this is just saying that if we could collect all variables that affect both the exposure A and the outcome Y, so in other words, their common causes, then adjusting for this set of variables suffices to eliminate confounding. And so, for example, in this very simple structure on the left, the simplest possible confounding DAG, uh, the common causes of A and Y are indeed just V, and so indeed V would be a sufficient adjustment set. Over here, we've got a slightly more complicated structure where the common causes are uh, both V and W. And so indeed, adjusting for both of these suffices to eliminate confounding. Now, I put the second example here because it also illustrates that uh, this common cause set V and W is um, not, it's not necessarily the minimal sufficient set. We could actually adjust for only W and that would be another sufficient set. Um, but my goal today is just to discuss rules to get a sufficient set. So I'm not, we're not trying to do a minimal sufficient set here. All right. So um, the analogous results that we're going to provide for selection bias are essentially this. So when the causal structure is such that covariate control can work to eliminate selection bias, then the set of common causes of the outcome and the selection indicator, not the exposure, the selection indicator, suffices to do so. All right, so just as a little teaser, this is gonna have some interesting implications for the missing data scenario of doing a complete case analysis. Um, 
So in particular, um, there are a number of influential papers relatively recently, which say that complete case analysis is unbiased only if the data are missing completely at random. Now, missing completely at random is a very stringent assumption, right? It basically only happens if your data are, uh, are lost because you drop randomly half of your test tubes on the sidewalk or something like that. Um, it doesn't really occur in practice. And so it's been argued that complete case analysis is therefore just inferior to methods that make the weaker assumption of messingness at random, like, for example, multiple imputation. So two examples of um, papers making this claim, uh, one paper in the New England Journal of Medicine said, we do not recommend using the complete case analysis approach to missing data since it requires the unrealistic assumption that the data are missing completely at random. Second paper in JAMA said, similarly, complete case analysis requires a far more restrictive assumption. They're comparing it to multiple imputation. That any data point missing is missing completely at random. So we're going to offer a counterpoint, which is that um, when specifically when we're estimating average treatment effects, we think it makes sense to actually routinely conduct a careful complete case analysis, meaning one that is uh, adjusted in a principled way for covariates, along with messingness at random assuming methods, not instead of, um, but we're going to argue that they, they actually provide complementary uh, information. All right, so uh, what do I mean more specifically by selection bias? Well, first of all, heuristically, um, we're just talking about a situation where our estimate is, is defined for some general population, but we obtain an estimate among only a selected subsample denoted by the indicator R equals one. Um, and so there's been some, some recent interesting work which um, tries to, at least heuristically, parse selection bias into two different sources. Um, Let's talk first about external bias. This one is a little bit more intuitive. And this is essentially uh, could arise from something like effect measure modification by the selection indicator. So in other words, like the causal effect among the selected group might actually be different from the causal effect in the general population uh, simply because they're, they're different individuals and they have different covariates, for instance. It's perhaps maybe a little bit of a, of a misnomer to call it bias, right? Because it's actually, this is referring to a difference between two population parameters, but uh, it's sort of a shorthand for an external source of selection bias uh, in the estimator for the R equals one group relative to the general population. Okay, then the second source is internal bias. And this is bias such that a naive estimate in the selected group is potentially biased even for the causal effect in that same group because, for example, we have some kind of collider stratification that is related to conditioning on our selection indicator R. So, um, okay, let's, let's look at this in kind of a classic M-bias type structure like this where we've got our selection indicator R, which is a collider between A and Y. So, um, in this example, we can think of this path from A to Y, which is unblocked conditional only on the selection indicator R, as internal selection bias. And so for this reason, again, the, the estimate I get conditional on R alone may not even be unbiased for the causal effect among the R equals one group, for example, the complete cases. Now, in this example, we might have another problem as well, which is external bias. And this is because we've additionally got this other path uh, between Y and R, which is unblocked conditional only on R. And you can think of this as um, a situation of effect modification by common cause, where V is the common cause. And so here we've got um, a structure where, again, the, the causal effects among the R equals one group uh, may actually differ from that among the general population. All right, so um, just some, some notation. So as usual, I'm gonna let Y sub uh, A1 and A0 be counterfactual outcomes for any two fixed treatment assignments, A1 and A0. And we're gonna work with conditional average treatment effects here. Um, and so for a given conditioning set Q, 
I'll let delta Q be the conditional average treatment effect among the general population, conditional on that Q. The estimate that we actually uh, can get at in the selected sample is called beta Q. And that one is simply a mean difference, right, but conditional on R. I'm showing everything on the difference scale just for simplicity, but all of these results are going to apply regardless of the scale. And so the game we're going to try to play is to find a sufficient adjustment set of covariates Q such that our beta Q actually is equal to our desired delta Q. All right. So if we know the full causal structure, then we're in luck. So we can apply um, any number of different existing results to find a sufficient set of covariates when they're available. So for example, if we want to go fully general, we can use Schwitzer and Perl's well-known conditional ID algorithm, which will give us these types of results for actually any type of conditional interventional distribution. There's also some other results that are more specific to settings of selection bias and missing data. I'll show you just briefly two simple SWIG-based identification criteria, which are um, designed to kind of map these intuitive ideas of internal and external selection bias onto respective graphical criteria. All right. So um, this is based on uh, drawing a SWIG rather than a DAG. And essentially, we have uh, one condition that tells us whether there's internal selection bias and a second that tells us whether there could be external selection bias. So the first of these two conditions is essentially just saying, for some conditioning set Q, is there a backdoor path in the swig between YA and A conditional on both RA and that set Q? And the second condition is just saying, is there any path between YA and RA that's unblocked conditional on Q? So we could just look at our SWIG and we could see if there exists a set Q that fulfills these criteria, and then we could collect and adjust for those. So to, um, to be a little bit more specific about internal versus external selection bias, so let's first think about cases where uh, the selection indicator is not affected by the exposure A, and I'll explain why in a minute. So in that setting, one way to formalize the idea of internal selection bias is as a discrepancy between our naive estimate beta Q from our selected sample versus the conditional average treatment effect in that same group, the R equals one. And so it turns out that if this first condition holds the no backdoor pass between YA and A conditional on Q and R, uh, then there is no internal selection bias. And so in this M bias structure, any subset of the covariates V and W would indeed suffice to get rid of the internal selection bias. All right, what about external selection bias? So again, for the setting where selection is not affected by the exposure, we could formalize external bias as a discrepancy between the Kate and the R equals one group versus that in the general population. And so it turns out that if the second condition holds, no paths between YA and RA that are unblocked conditional on Q, then that suffices to have no external selection bias. And so in this structure, uh, W or both W and V would work to eliminate external selection bias. But interestingly, V alone does not, right? Because V blocks this backdoor path but it doesn't block the YR path. And so you can see how the choice of, of conditioning set would depend on you know, whether, whether the target of inference is the Kate in the general population or that among only the selected group. All right, so that was when the selection is not affected by the exposure. Um, what if in fact selection is affected by the exposure? Well, this poses some interesting conceptual challenges for defining estimates of interest among quote unquote, the selected group. And hence for defining what we even mean by internal and external selection bias. This is because we're essentially in a post-treatment selection type of problem where the selected group actually comprises different people um, under interventions setting A equals one versus A equals zero. 
And so the factual selected group R equals one is actually neither of these. So um, it turns out that the same graphical rules actually still apply, um, but the decomposition into external versus internal bias instead of referring to the Kate among the, again, factual R equals one group, instead it refers to a different quantity. And this different quantity is what's called a net treatment difference. This is the net change in outcomes that would occur for the selected sample if all members of the general population were treated versus if all were not treated, including any effects of the treatment on the actual individual membership of the selected sample itself. So this is not a causal effect um, because it's not a holding constant the individuals of interest. It's a different type of way to break down the selection bias. Now, this is not the only way to think about post-treatment selection. There's also uh, principal stratification type approaches, things like survivor average causal effects. And so you can talk about uh, causal effects in this setting, but this is what we use for this particular decomposition. All right. So we're done, right? We have some graphical criteria. We can deal with selection bias through covariate adjustment. Okay, talk is over. Okay, just kidding, because um, often we don't know the full causal structure. And I think this is actually particularly a problem with selection bias, more so than with familiar cases of confounding. And that's because, you know, especially with these two graphical criteria in mind, we can see that the types of structures that could have selection bias is this huge menagerie of different possibilities, right? So here's here's the unbiased one we just saw. But then there's also structures where, you know, we just have, we like R is, is actually de-separated from A. Um, there are some where, uh, you know, maybe R is just a descendant of the outcome. So this can have selection bias or Maybe R is a descendant of a common effect of the exposure and outcome, or maybe R descends from mediator. So there's all these different possibilities. And in any given realistic setting, we may not actually know exactly which of these we're in. And so that's why we wanted to try to think up some general rules for which covariates to control, even if we don't actually know the full causal structure. All right, let's pause and see if there are some questions at this point. Um, okay, so didn't James Heckman and other econometricians deal with a lot of this in the 70s? Heckman got the Nobel Prize for his papers on selection bias and other work. See, for example, Heckman's paper, Selection Bias as a Specification Error. Um, yeah, so great question. And um, yeah, Heckman did propose some really interesting and useful models for selection bias. Now, um, at least the, the canonical forms of those are ones where we specify the actual mechanism of selection bias. So we specify the mechanism that gives rise to, for instance, R equals one versus zero. And so we're interested in situations where perhaps we don't have quite that level of knowledge. Maybe we have some partial knowledge of the structure, um, or maybe we even know the full causal structure as in the SWEG criteria I showed earlier, but we may not have like the actual um, function that, that gives rise to R. Okay, there might be, okay, so chat is just the slides. Okay, so now let's move on to what we might do when we don't know the full causal structure. So again, our goal is to find a sufficient adjustment set of covariates to get our naive sample estimate beta Q to equal our general population case delta Q. We're gonna do this non-parametrically, and not place restrictions on variable types or link functions. Now, just at the outset, um, if we're defining selection bias in terms of a discrepancy between beta Q and delta Q, well, this could happen for reasons other than what we might think of as selection, right? Could just be that we have plain vanilla confounding. And so for clarity, we're gonna separate our overall conditioning set Q into two subsets. One is a set C of covariates that suffice to control for confounding in the general population, meaning when R is not conditioned, there are no unblocked backdoor paths between Y and A conditional on C alone. Okay, and so the point of this is that, you know, we could use our familiar, let's say, uh, Perl common cause principle to select the set of covariates C. We just imagine that there's no selection and we think about doing an analysis in the general population. 
Our second covariate set, Z, are those that suffice to eliminate selection bias when they're conditioned along with C. So for example, in the structure here, um, we could set C equal to W. That would eliminate backdoor paths between A and Y in the general population, so not conditional on R. And as we'll see, our set Z of covariates that would eliminate selection bias when conditioned along with C could be just V itself. Now, just for simplicity in the examples to follow, I'm going to just show only cases where the empty set suffices to eliminate confounding in the general population. All right, now another thing that's really interesting and tricky about selection bias, and perhaps more so than thinking about confounding control, is that we need some ground rules on what types of covariates we are willing to consider controlling. Some types of covariates might eliminate selection bias at the cost of creating some other type of bias. And so we're gonna put some ground rules down for the covariates that are even candidates to consider for the set Z. So in particular, we're not gonna consider conditioning on descendants of the outcome or of the selection indicator. This would give us something that is either not interpretable as a causal effect or not interpretable as the, the causal effect that we want. We're also going to exclude variables that are mediators or descendants of mediators because we're dealing with total effect estimation. All right, so the first main result is the following common cause principle. So this says that if there exists a sufficient adjustment set for the causal structure, then the set Z of all common causes of R and Y excluding the exposure and its descendants is also a sufficient adjustment set. This clause about excluding the exposure and its descendants is again, because of these ground rules about uh, which covariates we're willing to consider. All right, so here are some really simple examples where the set of common causes of R and Y is just identically V. And so indeed, in all of these cases, uh, a sufficient set actually does exist. And so V itself will work. And I guess what's useful about this is that we don't actually need to know which of these structures we're in specifically in order to know that V would be the sufficient adjustment set. We, we only need to know that uh, it, it, it constitutes all the common causes of R and Y and that these are structures where a sufficient set exists. Now. Um, this is interesting when we think back to the issue of missing data, because some of these cases could actually be missing not at random. So for example, in this first structure here, suppose that just for simplicity, A is the only incomplete variable. Well then R, the complete case indicator, is also just an indicator for whether A is observed. And Heuristically, and glossing over some important details, um, this is a missing not at random scenario, essentially because R is associated with an incomplete variable A conditional on the other variables which are complete. Now, I just want to I just want to point out that there's some really interesting complexities and difficulties with assessing whether MAR holds in graphs. And so um, I, I encourage you to, if you're interested in this, to take a look at these two papers, which are really interesting. Okay, so there's also some bad news, which is that um, some causal structures are hopeless if we are trying to eliminate selection bias through covariate control. There does not exist a sufficient adjustment set anywhere in the graph. And so the second result is telling us that these types of cases actually fall into two categories. So that's the silver lining is, okay, so unfortunately these cases happen, um, the silver lining is that they do fall into two categories that have some good intuitive traction. So the second result says that if a sufficient set does not exist for the causal structure, then we're in one of the two, one, one of the following two cases, or possibly both. First case is what we call type D insufficiency. And this is where there's a directed path from Y to R or vice versa. The second case is type M insufficiency. This is where selection is an AY mediator or it's affected by one. 
Now, the I think what's potentially useful about this is that, um, again, even if we don't necessarily know the full causal structure, we might be able to reason on substantive grounds in any given applied analysis about whether these things seem plausible. So here's one example. Um, let's say we have a longitudinal study where uh, the exposure is um, a more stringent blood pressure target and the outcome is atherosclerosis. And it's a longitudinal study. And so uh, we might have attrition. And in particular, people might not come back to the lab to have their atherosclerosis measured by some ultrasound procedure, okay? So maybe we can think through whether these cases are plausible. Well, here we might think that a directed path from R to Y, well, that would represent that for some reason, coming the, the act of coming into the lab to have your ultrasound conducted affects your atherosclerosis. That seems maybe a little implausible. Another possibility is, you know, could we have a directed path from Y to R? Well, that would mean that your atherosclerosis affects whether you come into the lab, and, and maybe it could, but it also seems like perhaps people don't know what their atherosclerosis status is, and so it seems like maybe more likely that there's a common cause of both atherosclerosis and coming into the lab. What about type M insufficiency? Well, so we want to think about what potential mediators could be. Um, well, maybe there's a mediator like exercise. Okay, so you, you're given this lower blood pressure target. And so uh, perhaps then you have to do more exercise and maybe that causes you to drop out of the study because you're too busy exercising to come to the lab. Okay, so that would be something where maybe we do have this type of insufficiency. And here are a couple of concrete examples. So um, in these cases, I've again boxed the variable V when uh, it constitutes the set of common causes of R and Y. But because in these cases, we, are, we have either type D or type M insufficiency, we have no guarantee that the set Z is actually gonna be sufficient in this case. So here we've got two examples where we have a directed path from Y to R. Uh, here, R is just a child of Y. Here, R is a descendant of Y that is mediated by some other variable V. And then over here, we have a type M case, right, where we have some mediator V and selection R is affected by that mediator. So I think as another connection to um, confounding, so generally what we try to do with confounding, right, is uh, try to think about what variables would constitute a sufficient adjustment set to eliminate the confounding, try to measure them, try to control for them, and then probably do some kind of sensitivity analysis, right, to try to query how much the results might have been affected by potential residual confounding if uh, either we didn't measure one of the um, one of the members of the sufficient set or we uh, we couldn't think of, of all of them at the outset. And so I think similarly, it makes sense to do a, a parallel approach with selection bias. So we could conduct sensitivity analyses that are kind of um, pleasingly analogous to uh, certain results for confounding, given again the the kind of close um, the close analogy between covariate control for confounding versus selection bias. And I, I won't go into this in detail, but a couple of approaches that uh, that could make sense to use are Smith and Vanderweil's uh, work on selection bias, and then some uh, similar approach that's more for missing data that I worked on recently. Okay, so I promised to talk about missing data and complete case analysis. So, um, so let's cash that out here. So uh, remember that if data actually are missing completely at random, then indeed, as the influential papers I mentioned earlier do say, this does guarantee that a complete case analysis is unbiased for arbitrary estimates and analysis models. But again, um, these papers do actually say that missing completely at random is actually necessary for a complete case analysis to be unbiased. And so therefore, that complete case analysis is just categorically inferior to missing at random assuming methods like multiple imputation. And I think what we've seen so far illustrates that this is an oversimplification, right? So there are actually many settings where complete case analysis could be unbiased when the data are actually missing at random 
or even as one of the examples I showed earlier illustrates, even when it's missing, not at random. Now, this is not new information. Um, so as, as early as 1988 and possibly earlier, uh, Nan Laird was already saying this. Uh, so for example, in her one of her seminal papers on missing data, she writes, complete case analysis may yield valid estimates of certain parameters, even with non-ignorable response. In other words, missing, not at random. Um, and so, uh, I, I, and in fact, I think, you know, we can see um, even re one relatively simple example pretty intuitively, which is, for instance, with case control sampling, which is a form of missing not at random where selection is dependent on the outcome. We're familiar with using logistic regression to obtain odds ratios, which will then be unbiased for general population estimates. Now, this is, of course, a very specific setting with one particular link function, but uh, so the, the, the goal of the, the graphical results I showed today was to kind of generalize our view of when uh, an adjusted complete case analysis uh, would indeed be unbiased in broader situations. And so the, the critical point is that if you adjust for a sufficient set of covariates using, for instance, this common cause principle or the SWIG criteria, if you have uh, full knowledge of the causal structure, then a complete case analysis will actually be unbiased even when uh, methods that are sometimes described as categorically better, like multiple imputation, may be biased. Um, and it's actually interesting to note that in simulations, which are of course never exhaustive, but at least in, in the simulations we did, um, it appeared that sometimes even when a sufficient set doesn't exist because we have either type D or type M insufficiency, a complete case analysis that is adjusted by these common causes does sometimes still substantially outperform multiple imputation when we're in messing not at random settings. Now, I don't want to overstate this. I'm not claiming that this will always be the case. There will certainly be cases where multiple imputation wins for missing not at random or even for certain kinds of missing at random. But it is interesting that there are these cases where complete case analysis, when it's adjusted in a principled way, will do better. Um, and so I think, uh, I think in conclusion, I do think it makes sense to routinely try to conduct a carefully adjusted complete case analysis along with missingness at random assuming methods and to compare the results and not necessarily assume that if there's a discrepancy, it automatically inculpates the complete case analysis as being wrong. No, it actually could be, it could be either. And so that's where we want to think through, um, you know, what kinds of graphical structures could give rise to these types of disagreements. All right, so in summary, um, so this is kind of my current thinking on what the, the practical take homes are. And I'm actually very curious, you know, if, if folks have thoughts on this, um, because so far it's been primarily an exercise in theory. So I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, thoughts on this, uh, the, the set of applied recommendations. I think it makes sense to start, of course, with thinking about whether a sufficient set is plausibly going to exist for our scientific setting. So in particular, asking ourselves whether it's plausible that the outcome itself affects selection whether selection itself, on the other hand, affects the outcome, and also whether selection is potentially a mediator or could be affected by one. It then makes sense to try to collect and adjust for variables that are common causes of Y and R. And it's important to note here that this may actually take some attention during study design, um, in particular because even though with non-randomized studies, at least, we are used to collecting a broad array of pre-exposure covariates that we will adjust for to try to control confounding, it's important to note that common causes of Y and R need not be prior to the exposure, right? They could actually be temporally after the exposure. And so as when we're doing, let's say, mediation analysis, and we have to worry about things like mediator outcome confounders, we can't necessarily just plan on, okay, we're just gonna assume that this baseline set of, uh, of, of covariates that are intended to adjust for confounding is gonna, going to contain all of the common causes additionally of Y and R. Um, another finding from simulations that I think is kind of interesting in practice is that 
um, we did find that even when a sufficient set does not exist, adjusting for the set of common causes often improves the performance of the complete case analysis. So it, it reduces, but it may not eliminate selection bias. And last, as I said, that in the setting of missing data, conducting a complete case analysis that is adjusted in a principled way makes sense to do routinely, I think, in addition to using missingness at random, assuming methods like multiple imputation. Um, great, so as I move into taking questions, um, just wanna thank again, my collaborators, Ilya Schwitzer and Tyler Vanderweil. Um, the slide deck is posted online if you want to get a copy along with the references, and um, here are some short links to the papers. So I think now um, I'll go ahead and answer the questions in the chat and then uh, would love to head into the discussion. Thanks, yeah, we should Q&A. Um, there are uh, three questions right now. Uh, the first one is like, is it correct to say that under the case of M insufficiency, the direct effect is still identifiable? Um, yeah, not necessarily, because this is a case where we again have this issue of um, we're we're changing the the group of interests, and so we're we're conditioning on uh, a a variable that's actually affected by the exposure. So not necessarily, but it depends on the the group to whom we're trying to do inference. Okay. Um, um, now th this is a longer one. Um, I'm just going to read it out. Um, so there are no disturbances in your DAX, but the properties of disturbances must be taken into account to get a consistent estimator. Selection usually affects the property of the disturbances. Have you gotten formally into estimation? I don't think you can assume these complications away in practice. There are also efficiency issues with the usual estimators. You may be better off doing nothing in the sense that you are closer to the truth. Yeah. So, um, so I think you're referring to, yeah, what if we have um, disturbances that are, so let's say we have some UX, UY, something like that, and then we have uh, selection that also affects those disturbances. So what we've assumed throughout the structure of these DAGs in this paper is that we are um, including all shared ancestors of the analysis variables that I've described. So that's R, that's A, and that's Y. And so these disturbances would be themselves included in the structure. And so uh, if we have a case where selection um, affects these disturbances, then uh, we would need to uh, basically include in that set of common causes variables that are, uh, you know, could be, they could, it could be that there's some variable that is a common cause of uh, UA and then UA affects A and then uh, A affects R, for example. And so then we would have uh, that variable in the set as well. Great, thank you. Maybe let's do one last one before we switch over to the discussion. Uh, so when a sufficient set does not exist in a sense that the conditional average treatment effect does not equal the naive estimate in the selected sample, could it still be possible that the estimate is identifiable from ob observables but not through covariate adjustment? Yep, for sure it's possible. Yeah, so um, in particular, one possibility is if we have... Um, some observables that are uh, complete for the, the entire general population. So um, one example would be like in a sort of classic mediation structure, um, if the exposure is fully observed and the, let's say um, some, some uh, mediator V, which has R as a descendant is also completely observable, well, we could just marginalize over them. Um, so that would be fine. Um, so indeed there are settings where a covariate adjustment will not necessarily um, identify every estimate that we can get through the observables. All right, great, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk and for answering these questions. Uh, we have a few more, but maybe we'll do them later. And for now let's uh, switch to discussion. Um, yeah, um, Nan and Eric, uh, whenever you're ready, feel free to join the discussion. Well, I'm happy to go first, Eric, if that's okay with you. I think, Maya, you can think of me as a naive reader who's really not familiar with DAGs, uh, but I very much enjoy seeing your paper and I've learned a lot uh, about how useful they can be in deriving really general results. Um, so I'm... I'm very interested in the role of A and Y and how you think about them. So is it the case, I think it's the case, that really the difference between A and Y is that the arrow always goes 
from A to Y in the DAX that you have uh, and not vice versa. So I guess I also think of this in the sort of way an ordinary statistician might think of this is that you're interested in the effect of Y conditional on A. So um, it may be that the way we think about these models are quite different in the uh, statistical uh, experimental design world than in the epidemiological world. So for example, um, I think it was Don Rubin who told me years ago, maybe 30 years ago, that you can choose your design space to be whatever you want. And it doesn't bias your result because you're choosing it to be whatever you want. And I think that is kind of conventional wisdom if you look at design of experiments, you choose your design space to be whatever you want. Um, and you don't actually think of people missing data in the design space. Certainly it can happen. Uh, it can definitely happen that in, even in randomized trials that people manage to lose what treatment a participant is allocated to. So there could be missing data. But the, the other feature that I have heard for many years, although I have to admit, I've been out of this uh, looking at missing data for quite a while. So it may be that I don't remember correctly, but I also have heard that if you're interested in why is the outcome, A is part of the design space, then if you're missing uh, information on A, it really doesn't matter if what you're interested in is estimating the distribution of Y given A. So I'm wondering um, why you care about missingness in A and what scenarios do you think really might be going on in that to make that an important consideration? Yeah, thanks, Nan. Yeah, so um, so in this particular work, we're not really distinguishing which variable is actually missing, but rather we're, we're sort of treating the selection indicator as selecting across all the variables. And so um, for that reason, like if we have a case where even if A is the only missing variable, but we have, let's say, selection as a an AY collider in the graph, then once we condition on R by doing an analysis that throws out not only the missingness in A, but also throws out the uh, the corresponding observations of Y, we could then have bias in uh, in the ATE of A on Y, for instance. Um, so yeah, so that's that's why we're concerned about that scenario. Um, well, I guess um, it didn't really answer my question. <laughs> you want to know the truth? I, I'm wanting to know in a practical setting, what are you talking about? I mean, you talk, I'm sorry, I didn't get to read the other paper you sent around, but you had kind of a example there, um, which I'm having, diff I just looked at it very briefly and having difficulty recalling it, but I didn't buy it, whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I guess in a practical setting, it could be something like, um, uh, you know, let's say um, we've got an RCT where um, uh, people drop out. It's a longitudinal study and people drop out based on both their exposure and their outcome. Maybe they drop out based on the exposure because uh, it it also contributes to side effects or something like that. And so we've got a directed path from A to R. And then perhaps we also have a path from Y to R because maybe uh, individuals who are doing worse in the study will tend to drop out, something like that. And so uh, that would be the kind of collider bias type setting I'm concerned about. Does that does that more closely answer your question? Um, yeah, that's helpful. Um, yeah. Um, well, you 
you actually mentioned one example, which I thought was a bit more realistic, was about um, whether or not a, a person's arterial sclerosis would affect their um, their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's so easy for people to measure their blood pressure these days. I think the m most likely scenario in that setting is people would measure their own blood pressure and decide whether or not to go in and have it taken in the study. Um, and, I, and I think that's a good example of where missingness might actually depend upon why, and it may or may not depend upon any treatment they receive. Although you could also imagine a scenario where uh, it could have to do with the treatment that they receive because people very much like to please their providers. Mm -hmm. So depending upon their attitude towards that, it could affect the treatment that they are getting as well. Yeah. And then that's also, yeah, kind of back to the mediation case where uh, perhaps we have uh, expo exposure as blood pressure target, mediator is exercise, exercise affects selection, because if you're exercising a lot, you don't have time to come back in. Uh, and then exercise is the mechanism by which the lowered blood pressure target affects atherosclerosis, for instance. So that's a case where, uh, yeah, we'll again have uh, no sufficient set existing um, and uh, selection is affected by the treatment. It's not affected by the outcome, but it is deconnected to the outcome. Um, so that would be, yeah, a similar case. Um, so I guess I wanted to um, point out another example where you have unbiased results. And this was due to um, a result obtained by Margaret Wu which predates many of the papers you mentioned who noticed that if you're doing a longitudinal study and you assume a random effects model so that you assume individuals have a random intercept and a random slope and that the missingness, so whether or not they continue to the end of the study depends upon their unobserved random slope or intercept then there's ways that you can actually use complete case analysis to get unbiased estimates of the results. So yeah. that's just another example. Mm -hmm. um, the, so the other, uh, other thing I'm puzzling about is um, you chose to, to, fix the data in the simulation so that the conditional average treatment effect is equal to the average treatment effect. And, and what did you do in the graphs, I guess, of the simulated data? So in the simulated data, is that automatically going to be true for no matter how you... Uh, and lost the data? Because um, you didn't tell us what you were actually presenting in the simulations, whether it was the average treatment effect or conditional treatment effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we did set them to be equal and that was essentially so that we could um, not have to worry about non-collapsibility when conditioning on certain covariates because we wanted to be able to compare, um, for instance, an unadjusted complete case analysis to an adjusted one and not worry about changes in the estimate due to non-collapsibility. Right. But again, I think there are many instances where that's not going to apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I definitely don't consider these simulations exhaustive by any means. It's more sort of an illustration of uh, a, a handful of different structures. But I do think that looking at sort of many different link functions. I mean, there's also other limitations as well. Like we didn't look at a, a huge variety of different missingness patterns. I think we know from the literature on uh, missing at random type situations that the patterns can be really important. Is it monotone? Is it non-monotone? Um, things like that. And so we didn't, we didn't delve into that in detail. I think that would be a really interesting follow-up to expand the scope of that simulation study. Well, I thought that your simulations are very interesting in the 
sense that in many cases, you know, the, the adjusted complete case analysis performs as well as missing at random, or I'm sorry, better than missing at random for the smaller sample sizes. Um, and I have to say, what I was surprised about was how well missing at random performs, even in, in situations, many situations where there's no adjustment uh, covariate. So I, I thought that was another quite interesting result of your um, of your simulation. So th those are the main points that I had. I think it's a very interesting paper. Nice contribution. Thank you, Nan. Really interesting discussion, Vice. Right. Thank you, Nan. Um, maybe it's time to give Eric some time to discuss this work by Maya as well. Sure. Yeah, so, so thank you for the invitation to, to discuss this paper. I agree with Nan, this was a very interesting paper and really thought provoking. And um, the recommendation is actually quite provocative as well. And you covered, Nan covered quite a bit of grounds. And so I'm going to try to focus on a few topics. Um, I, I, I was intrigued by many choices that were made in this paper. I was intrigued by the choice of focusing on adjustment. Um, I like DAGs. I like the fact that you can state your assumptions clearly on a graph. Um, but one of the I've, one of the um, benefits of graphs and DAGs and SWIGs and is that you can reason about different ways of identifying a parameter. And um, I found it limiting particularly for missing data to think only about adjustment. I think it's very natural for causal effects. For missing data, it, it felt a little less natural. And this came through particularly in one of the, the M insufficiency, which I, to me um, was very convincing case that um, there's a need to have a more broader view of, of selection bias with missing data. There, and let me just, I, I don't know if, if there's any way you could show slide 27, because I think that's the one that I want to refer to specifically. And I'll focus on this particular point. I had a few other points, but I'll focus on this one in particular. And so, so you know, most people, particular statisticians who do randomized trial encounter missing data in the context of of people dropping out. And so you, you will typically have Y missing and you might have follow-up V. So the type M insufficiency is a graph that I'm looking at. It is randomized, um, but we don't observe Y on everyone. And the reason, and in fact, with, with none, you went through an example where in fact you had this situation. Um, now, assuming that you're following people over time and you have covariates V that are observed, um, this, the total effect of A on Y is identified by the G formula um, here. And this is one of the cases that's the most common case where you have post-treatment correlates of the outcome. And most statisticians would say, I should try to take care of that because I believe that the reason people are dropping out is correlated with how they do and I have data on those. Adjustment will say, no, you can't. Um, you can't account for this when in fact it's testable whether or not you're in this situation and we know how to address this. And so to me, this is a important hint. I mean, I get the, I get the appeal of adjustment um, and, and complete case adjustment, the simplicity of it. Um, but I think it comes at a really big cost. And my concern is that the recommendation that one should routinely do a complete case analysis, I would rephrase it a little bit more cautiously um, that one should think carefully about the assumptions and write the DAG, everything you say goes through and then think about identification in that context because there are a million ways to identify. Um, so that was more of a comment. And then I have maybe some questions, but I, I, I wanna give you a chance to respond before maybe asking additional questions. Yeah, thanks, Eric. That makes a lot of sense. And I really agree. And I think one thing that, uh, I mean, this being kind of my first foray into the missing data space, I think I, I got very surprised at what seems like the huge gap between the really sophisticated ID approaches that are out there for missing data versus the current state of practice, which feels like it's essentially complete case or multiple imputation, and, and that's kind of it. 
So I totally agree. I mean, I, I think there are really interesting idea results out there that that should get a lot more um, airtime. And I think it's also it also speaks to a limitation of even the the graphs that we're looking at in this paper, which have a single selection indicator. So we're inherently not looking at sort of separate missingness indicators for different variables because we're just looking at complete case or or not. Um, and so we're actually doing a follow up now where we actually are using um, the kind of quote unquote like missing data graphs, which have separate selection indicators for separate variables, which which do allow um, for many other types of idea results, some of which have already uh, been published. We'll be specifically looking at kind of more imputation based approaches. But yeah, th those are situations, for instance, where, um, as you said, we certainly could uh, identify the Kate in this final graph here. Right. And so so the way I would reformulate the, the recommendation is that um, complete case sometimes is good enough for uh, adjusting for, for, for selection. But I think you have to be incredibly lucky in those in realistic situations, because the concern that most people have, and I will disagree with the statement that it's either complete case or imputation. I mean, uh, IPW became particularly popular because of its ability to incorporate post-treatment covariates to adjust for missing data. And so this is, I mean, I, I, I think in most of epidemiology literature, this is probably the, the and, and, you know, um, maybe um, Jamie and, and Miguel and, and, and the folks at Harvard have, have contributed a lot to popularizing it as a way of, of thinking carefully about dropout and selection. So, so I think, I, I mean, that may be the, the, the one disagreement that I might have with, with your rebuttal. Um, and then I had, I had some questions. Um, one question is, and I think maybe someone maybe in the chat asked about this, which is that often you have non-monotone missing data. Um, it, it's not the case that nothing is observed. The case where nothing is observed is actually really interesting because uh, that was the sort of Heckman situation because there it's not even clear what, what is the causal effect of interest because I think you really have to think about what the selection means. Um, it, it could be that the internal causal effect is actually the only one that's of interest um, because um, that's the only place where the mechanism actually makes sense. Um, and and so so, um, but I'm 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 getting myself um, distracted. Um, my question was, in fact, in non-monotone settings where um, you know um, some variables may be missing for some people and other variables on others, and then some people have full data and so on. Uh, if you do a complete case analysis in many of those situations, you end up with like no, barely any, a small fraction of the data, uh, the individuals who have full complete data on everything. This is the most common situation in survey and cohort studies and um, that you have these kind of patterns. Would, would you stand by this recommendation about complete case analysis, even in those settings? Well, certainly not if you have zero zero data. I mean, you're absolutely right. Like you could have just a very inefficient estimator in those cases. Um, and I think there are many better approaches, including uh, your recent, well, I guess 2018 uh, paper with Sun uh, looking at non-monotone settings in IPW. Um, and certainly those, I think we would expect to perform much better. Um, yeah, so this is kind of, I think this is especially useful for settings where um, we have something closer to kind of all or none missingness, which could happen in a lot of uh, sort of like canonical selection bias settings where um, it's not so much sporadic missing data throughout the data set, but it's rather, you know, either we observe you or we don't, um, or in cases where uh, we have something closer to variables being missing together. But yeah, certainly agree that would be a case where um, this would either be completely infeasible or just very inefficient. So I'm going to have to interrupt you there. Uh, we are. I was done. Oh, okay, excellent. Um, well, I would like to really thank Maya for being here and giving this presentation and Nan and Eric, it was lovely to have you both here being the discussions. Um, next week is, um, Thanksgiving week in the United States. So we will have a thanks, Thanksgiving break. I hope uh, you'll have a lovely Thanksgiving and we will return on November 28th with Yuki Gu from Columbia University. And thank you for being here. Thank you all. It was thank really you. a pleasure and an honor. Thanks everyone.